stir your nerves and to offer your mind critical thinking and adventure. I'm Jay Dylan Proctor. I'm Amanda Sparrow. And I'm Anthony Alegria. And today we're going to be talking about bad villains, um, particularly some bad villain costumes that were, were in the TV series Doctor Who. Then we're going to look at some bad cultural villains, which have been sort of interesting in the last few years. Then we're going to ask some, some questions for Christians today. And, of course, feel free to, to respond with your own responses to these questions, and we're just going to have a good time. Right, and so, as Dylan said, our next section will be questions for Christians today, and that may sound like a really bad segment on the 700 Club, but we hope that it will be enjoyable and that we'll invite you to participate and to think about. We may actually be a bad segment on the <laughs> 700 Club. Um, I hope not. Then, it, then again, I kind of do hope so. That would that would be nice to have that audience. But at the same time, I don't think any anybody that... that listens to this is old enough to watch the 700 club 700 club is age restricted on people that are at least 700 years old <laughs> um so that being said anyways uh first thing we're going to look at today is some bad doctor who villains and their their bad costumes that they have so this is pretty entertaining um and you can just contemplate your own aesthetics and your own <laughs> wardrobe so let's get right into this um and as we look at this we look at this first guy he, he looks a bit like a, is this a, a drag queen? Like, what, what do we have going on here in terms of villainy? No lapels, though. <laughs> yeah, so as something we discussed earlier, it seems like the more villainous you are, the, the less lapels you wear. Get some. But this one, he, he's probably the best dressed of the worst dressed. <laughs> yeah, he is the best dressed of the worst dressed. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it kind of reminds me of a certain woman of the year. Maybe. Based on, like, the white. And there he is again. These guys aren't too interesting. There's your typical chrome. All right, so here we get the the Carnival of Monsters. I mean, look at this. Look at this hat this dude has on. I just want to know where where would you ever get up in the morning and be like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna fashion myself with like some clear plastic yeah the, bowler hat. It has like a those? green trim. A green trim. That's a green yeah, that's that's a lot to look at. That's a, a very fashionable. Look at these bros. They weren't sure if they were robots or lizard men. I think. I'm not sure. They may have not known when they were designing the costume what they were going to be. <laughs> Just fill in I the do, blank here. I do actually kind of like the main one, but then if yeah. you look at his like cronies, like there's such low quality. It's like they're, back there. they're wearing insulation as. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would not be comfortable. That would be itchy. Here's Anthony. If Anthony were a Doctor <laughs> Who villain. <laughs> I do not think I look like that. Yeah, I I see it. I see that, and I'm like, this is this is Anthony's new look. It's not. Not much going on there. No, it does. It does look like a soccer mom trying to, like one of those makeup tutorials. So. Yeah, it is a makeup. <laughs> and here is an even more interesting makeup tutorial. <laughs> um, gone bad. Gone bad. Or like some late nineties background or uh, background uh, dancers. <laughs> yeah, they they are well. They might be like this is Lady Gaga's new outfit. So, <laughs> which true. I guess she's kind of fell to the wayside. I do kind of like the uniformity. It is uniform. They're they're very one with each other. Yes, they are. <laughs> These bros, the dominators. It's like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles gone bad. Um, Most impractical one. Yes. And here we get Helen A., Helen Alpha. And she has her Charlie dog with her. Uh, here in a moment we'll reveal how much her dog looks like my dog. Um, but look at that. The Happiness Patrol. <laughs> it's really not that bad of a costume on her part. It's just the fashion dog she has with her that really <laughs> sets her off. Well, they, they could have gotten a real uglier dog Yeah, than that. There are real dogs that are that ugly. Um, <laughs> there are. All right, and here is a picture of the Charlie. Yeah, so this is what my dog looks like. He's a good dog. He is the the goodest boy. He is the best boy. <laughs> um, they use some dog lingo, goodest. But, anyways, these are what some some villains look like in in science fiction. But yet we get real villains that are that are also of this level. If we if anybody remembers back in 2012, we had Tanning Mom, the the true cultural villain. Everybody loved to to. To be upset with tanning mom, she she will tan her kids, she will tan your kids, she will tan herself. Will everybody she tan gets... your kids, tan your wife. <laughs> yes, and tan your husband, tanning everybody. So yeah, don't let tanning mom come into your culture because nobody needs to be that tan. Um, but not the only villain. If you if you remember any of these villains, please do comment. Um, another great villain that we had from the past was of course the the Miami Zombie, the guy who basalts, he runs out into the streets rips the, the homeless man's clothes off, tries to eat his faith. That that was also a, another thing. But the fashion choice that is so questionable about about Miami Zombie isn't the fact 
that he he just has this chin strap beard. But the true fashionable question is actually his name. His name is Rudy Eugene, which just cracks me up every time I hear that somebody is named Rudy Eugene. Um, I don't know why that's a funny name, but it is. But anyways, moving on to other cultural villains, we we now get the recent Hina Tattoo Mustache Man. So this happened here in, in recent days. Um, there's a couple of articles surfacing around the Internet. This man, he got a Hina Tattoo, and he had an allergic reaction to it. And as a direct result, he now has permanent scarring to remind him of that Hina Tattoo. And, of course, it's shaped like a... A pirate, so <laughs> really honestly, mustache. that would be like the worst ending of a joke ever. Like <laughs> trying to pull that like a joke, and then all of a sudden you're left with the permanent one. Yeah, yeah and this life choices um, don't get anything that you can't live with for life. <laughs> and evidently, that doesn't just apply to, to actual tattoos, but it applies to the Hina tattoos mm-hmm. as well. Be careful. Be choosy. Um, be very choosy, because. Mm-hmm. Could, could end up with a permanent scar that looks like a bad mustache. Yes. It wasn't even a well-drawn mustache either. It's the thing. It's, it's just it's so terrible. Um, be choosy. Be choosy. Um, so the takeaway from all this is how do we not be a villain? In our modern culture, there is very little agreement on what's actually good. We, we have all these really phony and fake virtues that people have created that's pick and choose. Um, some of the old virtues, people have wanted to throw out the old structures of, of religion and morality. And what we found ourselves in is a lot of chaos. I actually do miss the days back in 2012 where we could all agree to, to be upset with Tanning Mom and the, the tanning there. Um, now people are so polarized, it's hard for us to even come to, together as a culture to, to, to poke fun at Tanning Mom. But in all honesty, when we come to the kingdom of God, we, we need to focus on not being villains, um, which means more than just wearing shirts and, and coats with lapels. Um, it's always a bad thing. All the... You look at dictators around the world, they're always wearing lapel-less jackets, but there's more to it than that. We do really need to have a, a strong moral code in life, and we're going to discuss all of that in our next segment as we, we ask some questions that we hope will stimulate you. Please respond to them, and we'll be back in a moment. So for our serious segment, we're going to ask some questions to you as the audience, and we're going to answer them ourselves, but I want you to really think about these. Let them stimulate your mind. Uh, these come in response to a survey that was given to, to myself, also to Amanda, about young clergy, but I think we need to ask more intelligible questions than what were just presented to us, and both to, to the church as a whole and both to culture as a whole. So indulge in these questions and let them stimulate your mind. All right, question one, who is responsible for charity? So I think kind of uh, my initial response to this question, kind of the easy answer is everyone. Uh, but it does become a little bit more complex when we think um, who who ultimately has the responsibility. And then when no one takes the responsibility, does somebody have the authority to force others to be responsible? The other thing is, is sometimes we think of ourselves and we say, well, we're, I'm not skilled enough or trained enough to help somebody. So I'm going to kind of pass that responsibility on to somebody else, to an agency or an organization or even a government. And so like I said, I think sometimes it gets really complex, but then we can go back to the simple answer and still find some very much truth in it. To the best of our ability, to the best of the resources we have at, at um, to us and to our own intelligence, we are to be responsible with that and to help others in need. So that would be kind of my answer. I agree with Amanda, um, but you know, I would I would like to press the point that part of charity is that it cannot be forced. You know, it, if it is if it is to be forced, then that's no longer charity. And aside from that, you know, I think that God respects free will for a reason, and I think that as humans, we should re- respect the free will of others as well. Yeah, and my thoughts on this is you can't by by compulsion or coercion force other people to be charitable. Charity is something which is best handled when local communities, when individuals say, we're going to be personally responsible for taking care of the needs of the people around us. Uh, One of the things that I would just add in regards to this conversation is for those of you who have kids, those of you who who know young people, we need to teach young people, we need to teach our children to be charitable, not to be people who force other people to be, quote-unquote, charitable, 
But we need to teach our young people that we as individuals are the place where charity starts. When we give to others, that is how we, we can make society a better place, especially here around the holiday times, um, around Christmas and, and other things which are going on in our world. Charity begins not by forcing other people to give up things, but by we ourselves saying we're going to sacrifice something here in the present to make things better around us. And that is completely different, personal charity, or I might even say locally organized charity, than some sort of government program or some sort of institutionalized program where we're forcing other people by compulsion to, to distribute things. We as individuals need to be engaged in charity. And send us your thoughts on that. So the next question we have for today is in regards to virtues. Um, earlier we were talking about villains. There's not a good consensus on what is actual virtuous in our society. We've tried to pick up the old moral structures and throw them out. We've seen what's happened in Hollywood and politics and the mainstream media. There's been a lot of corruption of virtues. We need to get back to having a good moral structure. Just like teaching your kids to be charitable is important, teaching your kids a solid moral structure that they can rely on is going to help them tremendously as we go through life. So beginning the quest of, of virtues, I have a question for you and for all of us here, and it's as follows. Do God's virtues transcend our knowledge of them, or do we know enough about God's virtues to rule whether or not they should be discarded? So another way we can kind of phrase this question is, are we wise enough to judge God or God's virtues? And I think it brings about some very interesting things um, also that we've talked about in the past about virtues and roaming virtues and, and things like that. Um, but basically, do we know enough to decide to, to choose to pick which virtues are actually universal, which ones can endure beyond culture and language and time. And interestingly enough, I think if they're a true virtue, if they're not just something that we've um, decided that needs to be a virtue, but if it is something that really creates structures of good, then they are going to be beyond um, any particular location or thought or idea. Um, one question I think that could be used to under to not understand but to answer Dylan's is you know how much deeper do God's virtues go than the platitudes we use to represent them you know like honor thy father and thy mother Dylan talked about that earlier before the show started and uh, I mean you know do people know why that is a virtue to honor your father and your mother I mean it, there's probably a lot more to it than people would give credit. Well, I mean, if you just look at that commandment, it's really the idea of taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. That's sort of a, another way of, of really translating and interpreting that. But it's taking care of people who have done things. They have contributed to society. And, of course, the, the understanding is when people, they, they get to a different stage in life, we need to, to take care of people and, and deal with people in a, a decent way. Um, again, that goes back to the idea that we as individuals are responsible for this. It's not something where we put it off on other people and say, oh, we're, we're going to take care of, of people by, by enforcing some compulsory program. No, we do it by being actual quality individuals who get ourselves together. Uh, but in regards to this question, really we look at everything going around. Uh, we look at the, the falling and collapsing of, of a lot of the, the pop culture icons we have now, whether they be people who have been commentators, people who are, have been actors and actresses and whatnot, one of the things that we, we can unmistakably see is that our culture thought we knew enough about the, the structures of marriage to say we can, we can pull sex out of, out of marriage and we can throw it around and do whatever we want. We can tell people to be hedonistic, just indulge in whatever pleasure you want. And even beyond the, the marriage thing, when we have told people just to indulge in whatever you want, we've removed the, the concept of sacrifice and delaying gratification in the future for something here and now. And people thought they knew enough about this. And as it turns out, when you, you delay the, the future for something here and now in the present, the time is coming when the, the future arrives and you, you've really messed yourself up. So my answer is no. We don't know enough about, about the moral structures to just say we can throw them out. We don't know how complex moral structures are and why they've been so transcendent. Because, again, a lot of these, these virtues and things, they've outlasted cultures. They've outlasted kingdoms. They've outlasted spoken languages. They've outlasted just about everything you can imagine. And, and that's something to, to really revere. That's something to hold us very important. Okay, so moving on to our, our next question we have. And, and again, just to reiterate, please send us your comments. Does, does God judge? 
in in pop culture, we hear the question a lot of time about, you know, Christians don't judge and all this stuff about the language of judgment. So just simple question, and we'll go around with this. Does God judge? Well, and I think so also tying like culture, we, we hear the phrase people kind of throw around very nonchalantly um, is only God can judge me. And so then we get to the question of really, like, do, does God judge? And, and furthermore, how does God judge? Because we can look at our scripture and even history and see where great tragedies and events have happened. And we say, well, you know, that's kind of, you know, God judged them. Uh, God decided that these people were worth being destroyed. And so this is what happened. <laughs> Excuse me. And so we have to, I think, get really into the, the what do we mean by the word of judge? As we've talked about before, judgment is basically evaluating something. It's looking at it and deciding, is it good? Is it bad? And there's also like third and fourth and fifth and tenth options. Some some things aren't good or bad. Uh, they're neutral or they're just silly or, you know, th there's other things, but that's judging. It's deciding the value of something. And so what does God do when God judges, when God evaluates? I think we, we say that God has these virtues, that there are virtues in which there are structures that keep things good. And so ultimately God does judge. However, God is not Zeus. And that's really how we paint God when we talk about, you know, the kind of lightning bolt throwing is we've traded in Yahweh for this, for a different kind of religion's view of a God. And so God does not sit up in heaven deciding who's going to heaven or who's going to hell or if your city's going to get destroyed by a hurricane or a pillar of fire. God has put certain orders and structures in the world. And when people do things that are against these structures, basically I use the analogy, if you go play out in traffic, you're going to get hit by a car. That's not God arbitrarily punishing you. That's a natural consequence of your actions. Now, there are tragedies. Sometimes you did nothing and things still, bad things still happen because of someone else's sin or just because of the general destruction and brokenness of our world. So please don't try to oversimplify what I'm saying. But God does judge, but I don't think it's in the way that we, especially in culture, try to depict God's judgment. Well, to build off that just for a second, and I won't spend a lot of time here, before we, we went on air, um, we were talking about uh, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and a lot of times people extrapolate different elements of the story and emphasize it. And I was hearing an interesting lecture on this a few days ago where somebody brought up the, the point and they were saying, you know, the, one of the magnificent things about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing to do with, with any of the things involved in it per se in this specific, but if you just abstract it for a second, it's this idea that when there are zero admirable people left in civilization when everybody's corrupt everybody's being violent with one another there are zero uncorrupted people left society collapses we a lot of times look at this as god's harsh judgment coming in but there's really a virtue lesson that says when when we don't even have a handful of good people left there's nothing left of society um i agree a lot with what amanda said earlier god's judgment is more about discernment than condemnation, which is an English connotation more than anything. And um, I think that, well, actually, well, yeah, I think that he doesn't judge by arbitrary standards either. His, ju his, his standards are transcendent, and they're more related to cause and effect than people might give credit for. Yeah, and, and even back to the language of condemnation, in Greek there's the word kriso, which is condemnation and crisis, and then this krino, which is also translated as judgment, which simply means to consider, to contemplate, to administer a, a new ordering of things where people and, and things are in their most righteous order with one another. So, so even if you go back to the ancient language of, of Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, the word we get translated as judgment actually splits into the idea of condemnation and crisis versus the idea of just healthy restoration and consideration, just thinking about something. Critical thinking falls into that um, language as well. All right, so moving along to our next question. This one is a bit more holiday-oriented, but it's something which is relevant in the, the life of, of our culture. And I'll just, I'll just go straight into it. Are angels real? I think there's a couple interesting responses. Uh, I, have, um, I was joking earlier about the show Supernatural that depicts angels in various ways, and uh, there's lots of kind of shows like that we, we've seen um, in our culture where they depict angels. And obviously, uh, we can say with all certainty that there aren't angels like that. Uh, whether it's Supernatural, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or uh, Touched by an Angel, it's probably not how they work. Or I'm really sure that's not how they work. 
Um, but so are there angels and then how do how does that work? One interesting idea I've heard about angels, and I'm not sure I'd have to do more research to see how I feel about it, but that angels are the personification of a message. And this is how we see them a lot of times in scripture, is that they have something important to tell. There's either a commandment to go and do something or a word of encouragement or even something prophetic that, that speaks to what God's desire and will is. And I think that's a probably closer to a healthier view of angels than something more Hollywood or theatrical. I don't know nearly enough on this topic to speak on it, but um, with conclusiveness. But uh, I think the references by Luke to Gabriel are really interesting, and I think that Jesus's reference to whenever when asked by the Pharisee whether or not. A woman who had had seven hundred seven husbands and each legally by the law had had seven husbands when she died, whose husband she would she be? They asked whose hus husband would she be? He said that no one will be given into marriage and that we will be like the angels. And I think that that's very interesting. So, you know, you've got Luke who's Jesus' disciple, you know, pr proposing the idea of an angel and then Jesus also, so yeah, interesting, interesting um, things there. Of course, the language of angel in English comes from the Greek word angelon, which is the word for messenger. It's not explicitly a supernatural being, one who is just a messenger. I mean, people are messengers all the time. Um, but I will say there is an interesting history behind the concept of angels. If you go back to the Old Testament, you go to the really ancient book of Job. And again, if anybody tells you they know just how ancient the book of Job is or the story of Job is, they're, they're probably not being totally... Um, honest or intellectually sufficient with you because we really don't know how old that story is. It's a very ancient story. Um, but in the story of Job, you get these these beings, and even the, the devil figure in that, who is the, the sort of Satan character, who really that language is a lot different than the di diabolical one of the New Testament. It's a very different language. But he's one of these figures who just walks to and fro the earth. They're not really what we think of in sort of angelic terms are just sort of these amoral beings that walk across the earth. And that's a really different concept than what we think of now with the, the modern renditions of angels. So I'm just going to leave it at this statement. The, the word literally translates as messenger, and that's, that's where I would leave that conversation, thinking of, of messengers. Because if we realize that angels are messengers, I think that still implies that we have responsibility in being messengers for for God, we have responsibility in taking the message of the kingdom of God and sharing it. We don't just need to rely on some ambient noise in the cosmos to to come and bring the the message of God there. We need to be actively participating in the the teaching of virtue, the teaching of the the message of the kingdom of God, and that is something we can all engage in. Well, one quick last question that I think is a bit more of a statement, uh, but is the question of what is Advent, and I'll let us go with that. So uh, kind of a very short answer to what is Advent. Advent kind of just simply means coming. And so in the liturgical calendar, the church calendar, Advent is the season before Christmas. It starts four Sundays before Christmas that we are preparing for the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, the babe in the manger. And so it is a celebration within the church that we prepare, we repent, um, we contemplate our lives as we anticipate the coming of our Lord. Yep. Advent is the arrival. And on that note, we will be back and we'll wrap things up. All right, so for our last segment, we're going to wrap everything up today. And we're going to answer another question. Um, we're not going to really get into all of this, but we are going to discuss the, the evolution of the, the character of Satan and the concept of Satan. Earlier I referenced the book of Job, where we see the, the role of Satan, um, which is really more or less the role of the accuser. If we get to the language that's used in the book of Job, it's a little bit unique from other concepts we see throughout Scripture, but it's this idea of, of one who is coming in to make an accusation, somewhat like an, a prosecutor in a, a modern criminal court setting. But I'm going to hand this over to Amanda, and we'll just share some thoughts on this today. So something to keep in mind is we have kind of this short discussion today, and then later on we'll, we'll have kind of go more in depth on the idea and, and the evolution of the idea of Satan. Um, but something to keep in mind as we go through this is that we are not, and Christianity is not dualist, uh, dualistic. And what that simply means is that there is not an equal opposite force to God. 
Uh, so there, as you know, God is, this, uh, is a being of good and light and order. There's not a being of darkness and chaos uh, that is equal to or that somehow is locked in this uh, cosmic eternal struggle or battle with God. We can definitely see in our world that there's brokenness and there are sufferings. And we can see in our scripture this personification and this accuser or uh, this diabolical one. But ultimately, this person or thing is not God's equal. That it is not something ultimately we need to fear that maybe someday it may usurp uh, God. So just keep that in mind as we talk about this, that um, especially throughout history, uh, Satan's been given a little bit more power than really um, he deserves. And so as we have this conversation, just keep in mind all of that. I do not know much about the development of Satan, but I mean, as you can see from some of these pictures, I do think it's interesting that he has weird, weirdly placed faces where he ought not. Yeah, the anatomy of the artwork of, of Satan oftentimes has lots of faces. It's a really interesting thing. It's not exactly anatomically correct, but it is suggestive of the fact that, that people's personalities are a bit layered and, and whatnot. Um, and just capping all of this together, Amanda hinted at the, the different language there, the diabolical one. If we even look at the, the language used in Scripture, if we go back to, to Hebrew and Greek, there's in, obviously an evolution. There's a lot of different names and things that are being used there. Uh, the name Diablo, which is also the devil, of course, comes from the Diabolon, if you go back to Greek, and then you get Satanon, and you get a lot of just different language that's used throughout Scripture. But one of the things that's really interesting, and going back to, to Amanda's statement there that it's not like two sides of the coin where they're equally powerful and just one is light and one is darkness. Obviously, light and darkness are not the same. Darkness is there in the absence of light. That's an interesting thing to, to conceptualize. But also when we look at the role of evil, a lot of times when we look at scripture in English, it translates things as like the evil one or whatnot, whereas we look at it in the original language, it might say something just like the evil, um, paneros, but it may not have a specific term there for one afterwards. It's sort of an implied um, term that it could be the evil one, but it also could even potentially suggest some sort of reflective evil as, as in the evil within us. And that's a really big different theological concept if we, we place all evil external to our, our person as opposed to something which is internal to our, our character. And that's that's an interesting concept to to contemplate. But as we come to this topic, and we'll, we'll return back here next week, um, the evolution of the concept of Satan and even the, the evolution of, of how we understand evil is very interesting. And again, it's something which transcends our knowledge of it. Well, let's wrap everything up. And of course, Anthony over there has to, to give us a cheap platitude to, to end the day. Hope. The one word platitude. <laughs> you know, in the last few days, of course, the, the beginning of Advent is amongst us, and the first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday of hope. But when you talk about something like hope, you really need more than just the single word there. You need the concept. You need things to be compared to, some better situation. Um, one word platitudes are oftentimes annoying. <laughs> hope. Well, hope. Anyways, well... With that, I hope you enjoyed our program. If you did, please subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Please like our, our, our page on Facebook. You can find us there if you just search for Kingdom of the Logos. You can follow me on Twitter at J. Dylan Proctor. And with that, I really hope you have a blessed day, and please share our content.